you may have seen this before. It's used in viral marketing and by YouTubers with no context. But what happened to the thousands of men ordered to walk toward Ground Zero after nuclear tests in Nevada in the 1950s, sometimes less than a half mile from the explosion? Were they fully aware of the risks? Was the Department of Defense aware of the risks? We cover declassified files. Subscribe to join us. May 8, 2003. The National Academy of Sciences, contracted by the DOD's Defense Threat Reduction Agency, writes this report. It finds radiation doses of atomic veterans active between 1945 and 62 were underestimated. Exposure to gamma radiation was undercalculated. Not every soldier was given a dosimeter designed to track it. Radioactive particles on the skin were also not accounted for. And estimates of inhaled radioactive dust were too low. The DoD, for example, failed to realize a blast wave would kick up radionuclides from previous tests. And most soldiers weren't given breathing protection. In the six years following World War II, five nuclear tests were detonated on the Bikini and Aniwetok Atolls in the Pacific. But that took too much time and logistical effort, so officials sought a place closer to home, settling on 1,300 square miles of federally owned land in southern Nevada. Codenamed Desert Rock, an estimated 22,000 soldiers participated in various tactical exercises at close range. By 1958, the U.S. had conducted over 100 tests at the site. After Priscilla, for example, troops came within 550 yards of Ground Zero. Men and tanks marched to 500 yards of the George test. In Hamilton, 25 unprotected soldiers were placed a mile from Ground Zero. Ten seconds after detonation, they were instructed to look at visual targets to determine if they experienced temporary blindness or confusion from the blast. It was not repeated. Here's an issue with this. DTRA reviews show the stated goals of the troop exercises were purely psychological to make sure they could follow orders after an explosion. It's what Assistant Secretary of Defense Frank Berry told Congressman Thomas Ashley in 1975. He wrote, no evidence of permanent physiological damage occurred. He adds, a full review of ionizing radiation's health effects would be expensive, time-consuming, and was a national security issue. Concluding with a canned response, radiation exposure in Nevada was carefully controlled and didn't exceed standards. Soldiers that exceeded this dosage didn't show any immediate symptoms, so nothing to worry about, right? Other documents highlight this cavalier attitude toward the full range of risks faced by atomic veterans. Nowhere did we find mention of inhalation risks of radioactive dust, for example or even analysis if there were enough dosimeters to accurately track individual soldiers. What's worse, it's not as if the risks weren't known. A 1944 study from the National Cancer Institute found a link between radioactivity and lung cancer. And an accident at Oak Ridge National Laboratory talked about inhalation hazards in 1948. Autopsies of nuclear workers beginning in 1959 even showed the Atomic Energy Commission was beginning to understand how exposure burdened the lungs. There's more. This memo shows, by the 70s, the DoD was aware the U.S. CDC had discovered increased rates of leukemia in veterans who participated in the 57 Nevada Smoky Test. That didn't seem to matter, though. By the early 80s, 99% of atomic veterans' claims submitted to the Veterans Administration had been denied. There was no central database tracking who participated in nuclear exercises, and a fire in 1973 destroyed millions of personnel records. 
The burden was on the veterans to prove they deserved health care. And because of poor dosimeter tracking, many that could prove they were there couldn't prove their exposure was unsafe. As time went on, research uncovered more disturbing health effects. In the 90s, a peer-reviewed study found those in the Nevada tests had a 50% higher risk of developing leukemia, a 160% higher risk of nasal cancer, and a 20% higher risk of prostate cancer than the average soldier. It was around this time when Congress finally took notice. After years of attempts, they finally passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, or RECA, in 1990. If a soldier contracted leukemia or 18 other types of cancer, they received $75,000. If they died of that, a next of kin got a one-time payment. Cardiovascular issues, though, were not covered, despite some evidence of a linkage. And perhaps most notably, RICA didn't include medical coverage of health issues suffered by descendants of atomic veterans. The connection between ionizing radiation and genetic mutation was well known when the tests were happening. A 1957 National Academy of Sciences report concluded, radiation damage lasts multiple generations and expresses itself in different ways with each offspring. Quote, any radiation dose, however small, can induce some genetic mutations. Despite this, soldiers were not informed of the risks posed to their children and grandchildren. One veteran told Stars and Stripes his son was diagnosed with a rare adrenal disease, his daughter died of a brain tumor in her 40s, and his granddaughter was born with a foot deformity. In 2014, UK researchers found the offspring of atomic veterans there had more miscarriages and stillbirths. And the likelihood of congenital illness at birth was eight times the expected figure. A similar study funded by the US Department of Veteran Affairs found differently though. They deemed it not possible to analyze descendants because it was too difficult to determine veterans' initial exposure due to, again, a lack of dosimeters given out by the DOD during the tests. And that's where we are today. Surviving veterans generally seem to want two things, a medal for their service and a national holiday. They have neither. Establishing a medal to recognize members exposed to a non-combat hazardous service would be inconsistent with the department's award program, the Pentagon said last year. And President Ronald Reagan did designate July 16, 1983 as National Atomic Veterans Day, but the holiday failed to re-up after one year. It's natural to ask how this happened how the federal government has been three steps behind since it decided to test nuclear weapons on U.S. soil 70 years ago. We haven't even mentioned the adverse impacts on civilians living downwind. Nor did we mention the soldiers in the Pacific tests or the indigenous peoples living near them. That deserves hours of documentary coverage. The point is this, though. Hundreds of thousands of people were affected by nuclear testing and were at the mercy of decision makers who arguably played it fast and loose with human safety, some of whom likely didn't have the necessary background in healthcare or ethics to even make these decisions. Here, an AEC file shows a redacted individual told the agency his wife developed cancer living near Groom Mine, Nevada. Quote, the mention of cancer was casual and there was no indication they intended to allege it was caused by radiation from test operations, the letter wrote, concerned only of military exposure to legal issues. So, what do you think? Was this just the government dutifully prioritizing national security over the health of soldiers? Or was it something worse? Disregard by those not in harm's way for those in harm's way. And should anything more be done about this today? Do atomic veterans deserve medals even though they weren't in combat? Or a national holiday? 
And what about a new genealogy study on their descendants? Let us know in the comments. Special thanks to our patrons, including Piotr Trisbill, which I hope I pronounced correctly. If you like what we do, consider joining them on Patreon and help us produce one new episode a week. Most of our traffic comes from external shares, so if you have any family or friends interested, we'd appreciate it if you asked them to subscribe. Thanks again. See you next time.